Good evening. Welcome to Socialist Organization and the Capitalist State. Uh, this is the last event of the Socialism 2020 conference that went digital. If you attended the final plenary of the Socialism Conference two weeks ago and are wondering why we're still broadcasting, we had some technical difficulties and we're thankfully able to reschedule this. Thanks to Dana and Duane for uh, facilitating the, the technology and thanks to all of our sponsors at Haymarket Books, at Jacobin, and the Democratic Socialists of America for sponsoring the entire conference. Um, we, when we originally set out to organize a conference, we were organizing an in-person conference that had been going for uh, a few decades where we drew thousands of socialists from across the country to talk about all, all different manners of history, theory, strategy, and to really get to know one another and learn from one another. Uh, when COVID happened, we had to compress uh, a, a schedule of 134 talks into five, which was, of course, you know, incredibly difficult to do and meant that a number of the important discussions that we wanted to host had to get collapsed into one. Um, we wanted to have, we really wanted to bring different parts of the socialist left together to talk about where we agree, what we think about the world, what we think that we should do about that, um, and and learn a little bit about what each other are thinking and strategizing in the future. So originally, we had a number of different talks. It was a whole track of discussions amongst the left planned. Tonight, we're going to try to compress a few of those into one uh, evening. Uh, we have an hour and a half to go through a few questions. We're going to talk about the big questions of like what is happening in 2020 and what should socialists take from that and how should we organize uh, in response to, to grow the socialist movement. I'm gonna ask uh, essentially the same question to each of our speakers, uh, which is, you know, in, in this particular area, in, in elections, in, in labor and the social movements, what has been happening in 2020 and what do we think that socialist strategy ought to uh, be regarding that? And then we'll have some uh, time for questions from the audience and uh, which people can put into the chat. And then we'll have a, a the speakers wrap up with a, with a, with a big overview. Um, just a few little housekeeping bits before we start. Um, if you like this video, please like it uh, so that other people can find it. If the stream becomes choppy, you can uh, just help by reducing your video, video quality. Um, and uh, the video will be recorded and we will send all the socialism videos uh, by email after the conference to all attendees. So uh, thanks to our speakers for coming and for coming back for this uh, makeup session. Um, I'm welcoming Amy, Eric Blanc and Jamie Peck to speak. I'm gonna give uh, each of them a chance to sort of kick off with an overview of what they think is uh, important in 2020. Um, Eric Blanc is the author of Red State Revolt, The Teacher's Strike Wave and Working Class Politics, and was a national surrogate for the Bernie Sanders campaign. He's a member of DSA and its Bread and Roses Caucus. Uh, Jamie Peck is host of the Antifada podcast and a producer and contributor at the Majority Report with Sam Cedar. She's also a member of the North Brooklyn branch of the New York City DSA and of Emerge, a communist caucus local to New York City. So uh, I, I just want to hear from the speakers at the outset. What, what are the big things that we've been looking at in 2020? There's been so much going on that I think it's easy to forget all that's happened. What are the things that, that, that stand out most to each of you um, uh, about 2020? And I think uh, we'll, start with, uh, we'll start with Eric. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's bizarre that we're only halfway through the year. I mean, it feels already like the Bernie campaign was a lifetime ago. Uh, I, I think obviously the most important development of this year is COVID uh, for, I, I think, reasons that should be self-evident just as far as the uh, almost really unprecedented changes that that's brought to just daily functioning of life. The political consequences, I think, is still very hard to say. It's too early to tell. Um, on the one hand, it's clear that working class people are getting devastated across the world. Uh, in the United States, it's a lot worse off than other advanced capitalist countries, particularly for people of color and working class folks. Um, and the ethos here has been just to let people die uh, in the absence of really like a concerted plan or a strong welfare state. That being said, I do think like with a lot of crises, um, there's potential for resistance and we've already seen that. And I'm sure we'll talk more about that. As far as the other big developments, clearly as far as protest wise, the upsurge for Black Lives Matter following uh, the police murder of George Floyd is just a game changer, both because of the centrality of white supremacy for the functioning of the capitalist system in this country, like challenging the police in the way that these protests have done goes to the core of 
uh, really what this country is built off of genocide of Native Americans, uh, enslavement of black people. And it's not the type of uh, struggle that is gonna be easily co-opted by the system. They're gonna try, and, and I think there's clearly attempts already to do that, but you're not gonna have an American capitalist system without racism and racist policing. And so the potential anti-systemic dynamics of the struggle are quite high. And I think that just the breadth of the movement uh, it's black led, but also spread to like every corner of the country. I was just in upstate New York for uh, like 4th of July and there was just as many Black Lives Matter signs as Trump signs, which is not the case when I was there like two years ago. Um, and then just the last big development, I would say, is the Bernie campaign, which again, it feels like is ancient history almost, but we shouldn't underestimate the number of people that both got radicalized and had their political expectations raised you know, obviously we, we wanted the White House, we wanted the political revolution, we didn't get that, uh, that's life. Uh, our enemies are very powerful. I think we have a better sense of just how powerful our enemies, both in the capitalist class, the media, and the Democratic Party establishment are. But the reality is the political discourse of this country has shifted dramatically to the left, in large part, uh, not just because of social movements and labor organizing, but because of the Bernie Sanders campaign and other class struggle electoral campaigns. And this recent, uh, iteration wasn't any different. You had millions of people uh, voting for open democratic socialists, questions of Medicare for all, Green New Deal, uh, basic class struggle demands have been legitimized, socialism has been legitimized, and even though we didn't win, those millions of people who voted for Bernie, those hundreds of thousands who got a taste of organizing through participating in the campaign aren't going away. And in fact, many of them were involved in Black Lives Matter, and I think that we are going to see that uh, Bernie campaign sort of the um, the residue of that continue to spark uh, struggles in the years to come. Great. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Jimmy, what, what stands out to you? What's important? So I agree with a lot of what Eric said, um, with the caveat that I think it's too soon to know what relationship the Bernie Sanders campaign will or will not have to the larger fight for global socialism, except in retrospect from, you know, our delightful floating pods when we have uh, fully automated gay luxury space communism or, you know, from our veal crates on Peter Thiel's blood farm, right? Uh, but it, it's certainly possible. I want to be optimistic about it. Um, I agree that uh, the COVID crisis obviously has really scrambled everything, really heightened the contradictions, as they say. Um, it's created a huge amount of chaos and immiseration the world over, but also I think created some openings for action and change and certainly uh, is changing the way a lot of people think about the global capitalist system. Um, we've also been seeing uprisings around the world these past few years around both political and economic demands. And, you know, oftentimes those things bleed together in Chile, Lebanon, Hong Kong, Sudan, elsewhere. Um, so I, I hope that, you know, the U.S. left can take some lessons from these uprisings in other places, as well as past uprisings that have occurred here. Um, and the rebellion for black lives is incredibly important. I mean, we had a wave of protest, direct action and riots, uh, the scope of which we haven't seen since the 1960s, right? And um, I spoke with Mike Davis along with my caucus the other night, great Marxist historian, and he's been around a minute and he agrees that this seems like something new in the world, seems like something momentous. So uh, I believe it. Um, it happened in all 50 states. It's a diverse cross-section of society. It's led by young working class black and brown people, uh, the kind of people that DSA is always wondering how to engage in our organizing. Um, it shows, I think, also despite what the media is trying to tell you, um, blackness and militancy can go hand in hand and often do, right? And furthermore, the fight for black liberation and the fight to abolish the police and the prisons um, and really connect the dots in terms of analyzing and spreading the word about how these things are instruments of white supremacy and of class rule under capitalism. Um, this fight is central to what we want to be focusing on as socialists. Um, 
like there have been efforts in the mainstream media and on the right to kind of um, kind of divorce the militant aspects of this movement from um, the black led aspects, which is a very old, very racist and also anti-Semitic uh, narrative going back to the days of slave uprisings. Right. The idea that, oh, black people are fine with being treated like second class citizens. It's just, you know, these outside agitators, these white leftists, um, communists and often you know what that really means is the jews it's like getting them all riled up or whatever and while there are white leftists participating in this movement and certainly jews and communists um, i'm one of them myself um that's not what's making this happen so i think that's really important um and and to show that like it's not just like DSA's composition is largely downwardly mobile white millennials, right? Not all of them, but that is the makeup, uh, statistically speaking, right? It's people who were promised the American dream and they didn't get it. They're doing worse than their parents did and they're mad. Um, and I think what this shows is people who were never promised the American dream, people who were never included in the American dream, they're mad too. And they're willing to fight. And it seems like a, an amazing positive development. And I think the primary primary um, task of organizations like DSA going forward is going to be uh, trying to figure out how to really participate in a valuable way in these movements and ask ourselves um, what we need to do to um, make ourselves fit and gain the, the analysis and the legitimacy to really participate in a meaningful way. Mm. Thanks. Thank you both. Uh, I mean, there's a lot to chew on in there, and I want to try to get to as much of it as we can with the time that we do. I guess the I want to start with the first place where it seems like there might be, you know, slightly uh, different perspectives, which is in, in elections. I mean, I think it seems that most, uh, maybe this isn't true. It feels like the, most people accept that the Bernie Sanders campaign was at least in the short term good for DSA. You know, there's a surge after he, he left the, the race. Um, but, you know, with, when Bernie left, it was it was a demoralizing moment for for a lot of us. If, you know, uh, I don't think there's any way around that. Um, and then COVID come, came right after that. But now, you know, it's, it's been a little bit of time since then. We have a number of, you know, victories all over the country in smaller local um, or, or national other national races you know, in DC and Philly and New York City, elsewhere. I mean, we're finally getting the results here in New York City and it looks like our candidates are doing really well. They're, up, up, you know, either up or trailing by just a few votes in a, in a lot of races. Um, so I guess I wonder, uh, you know, what? how do each of you think elections should fit into a uh, socialist strategy? Uh, Jamie, why don't you go first? Mm, that's a slightly different question than the one that you uh, sent me, but I'm going to okay. give it my best shot. Um, how should they fit into socialist movements? I mean, I, uh, I guess I should lay my cards on the table and out myself as a bit of an electoral skeptic or rather <laughs> an electoral agnostic, right? Because like I said, I don't think there's any way to know what relationship any of this stuff will or will not have to the social revolution, except in retrospect. Um, but I think it's, it's possible. It has its place. I'm not like mad that people are doing it, certainly. And I went to New Hampshire and I volunteered for Bernie because I wanted him to win. Um, I think it's clear from the collapse of the Sanders campaign that the left is very far from the kind of institutional power that would enable us to win a presidential primary and ultimately the presidency right now, or even basic concessions like Medicare for all. Um, Bernie tried to reverse engineer a mass movement where there wasn't really one and had some success doing this. A lot of newly politicized young people got involved uh, from a broad cross section of the working class. But, you know, we have something else working against us, which is uh, depoliticization. And I've been really influenced by some stuff that Assad Hader wrote about this. Um, I feel like I have linked it many times, but I'll do it again. Um, Basically, the belief that a better world is not possible. And I think this manifests itself, especially in the electoral sphere, because it's operating so many layers removed from most people's lives, right? The, the, the single biggest indicator of whether or not someone's going to vote is their 
socioeconomic class, their income. And um, where's that going with this? And, and a lot of voters, um, like, yes, half of people don't vote. And then when people do vote, um, they don't necessarily vote for our candidates. Um, like, I think it's especially, especially depressing to see all the voters um, in the exit polls who support Medicare for all or even socialism as a concept, but still voted for Biden because they cited beating Trump as their number one concern, right? And this ties back to depoliticization, the belief that a better world's not possible, um, that the best we can hope for is to choose from the options that have been presented to us our entire lives, right? The Republican death cult or this kind of tepid neoliberal incrementalism represented by the Democratic Party and the Democratic establishment. So we're, we got a lot working against us here. Um, Bernie's politics are politics of optimism and solidarity, right? So it's not that surprising that people living in an atomized society, a racist society, divided along so many different lines, people who haven't experienced much solidarity in their lives. And, you know, for older people who've seen the failures of actually existing socialism in the 20th century, um, it's not surprising that they would be a little pessimistic about this project, right? So um, I think... Electoral politics certainly has its place because many people do engage that way. But we also need to recognize that that leaves out a whole lot of people, a lot of people who don't vote because they don't think it's going to do anything and they've never seen it do anything before, which is like not an irrational position for a working class person in this country to hold. Um, and the people who, you know, they vote, but they don't, they're not they don't have the optimism to vote for Bernie style candidate. We need to give people chances. Oh, and all the people who can't vote, right? Because some of the people most oppressed by capitalism are incarcerated or they are undocumented immigrants. So they, that's like not even a question in the first place for them. Um, we need to be engaging people in all of the places where they're coming into contact with capital in their lives, the workplace, um, the home, housing organizing, um, forming mutual aid networks to help people survive. Um, what else? We need uh, real institutions of working class power, tenant unions, um, transit rider unions, uh, alternative media, democratic labor unions, resource hubs for immigrants, uh, et cetera. Because I really think we're going to get more bang for our buck fighting capital at points of direct contact like bosses, mm -hmm. landlords, and the police. Um, that said, you know, uh, oh, I'd also caution the left against putting all its eggs in the electoralism basket because um, it can be very, the, 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 the way the campaign cycles end can be very deactivating and that's also a problem. But that said, you know, um, the old order is not that strong. We've seen some progressive wins at the local level, folks like AOC, Mondaire Jones, Jamal Bowman, and more. And I think as we have more and more of a base building project, as we build more working in class institutions from the ground up, we're going to see this bubbling up into the electoral sphere in a very real way. Mm. Thanks. Uh, Eric, what do you think about electorals? What, what, what role should elections play in st social strategy? Yeah. So, I mean, I agree with a lot of what Jamie said. I, I do think that maybe one difference we have is, um, how much emphasis to put on electoral politics. I definitely don't think uh, we should put all our eggs in the electoral sphere by any means. Uh, you know, the short version of what I think and, you know, other comrades uh, who share a similar perspective with me is that, yeah, you need to combine electoral work with social movements uh, and labor organizing in particular. So it's definitely not a, like, all electoral strategy. That, that being said, I, I'm not as agnostic as Jamie as far as the benefits of what electoral politics can do for the socialist movement. Um, because I don't think it's just like something we're gonna see in retrospect in a distant future because we can look at just what's happened in the last four years. And I, and I think that it's pretty clear that the uh, electoral wins that have been made and then also some of the losses, including you know the Bernie campaign, uh, have just been game changers for putting socialism back on the map of American politics. And this is the type of thing that we almost take for granted now. Um, the idea that, oh yeah, like a democratic socialist plausibly could have won the White House and that you can be a socialist 
in public and not feel weird about it. Like I, I've been a socialist since I was 14. Up until pretty recently, like you were considered a bizarre person and you really wouldn't openly say you were a socialist. And that changed first and foremost, I think, after the Bernie 2016 campaign. And so that isn't to say that we can place all of our eggs in the electoral basket. But my worry is that if the left uh, reverts to what it used to do, which was to say, yeah, electoral politics is fine, but really the real thing is uh, social movements and not trying to really systematically combine doing both, um, which really was for decades how the left, the far left, at least in this country, operated, which it was almost exclusively uh, in the streets uh, without an electoral expression. That led, I think, pretty clearly to our marginalization. And part of the reason that we are at least plausibly posed, uh, poised to be able to make inroads into rooting ourselves in the working class. And I think I agree with Jamie, like the composition of DSA right now is not representative of the multiracial working class. Uh, and then the question then becomes, how do we build that base? How do we connect DSA and the socialist movement generally uh, into the different communities that uh, a lot of whom did vote for Bernie um, disproportionately and who've been participating in you know, Black Lives Matter protests. And I think that the recent wins in New York, for instance, show the possibility for local and state races um, to start winning victories. And I think if anything, we're just on the cusp of uh, really what could be a much deeper electoral uh, strategy because once you have enough socialists in office, you're able to do things that right now we just don't have the numbers to do. For instance, using electoral uh, vehicles once you're in power to really systematically organize mass meetings. Think about the possibilities in New York now with our new socialists elected in Albany, where it's not just what they do up uh, in Albany, but what they do to organize block by block, you know, building by building uh, working class folks. And that is a perspective of like building socialist caucuses locally in the different uh, Congress is um, different, different legislative bodies and ultimately nationally that I think is going to put us in the direction of an independent workers party. And that poses the question of breaking the Democrats as like a long-term strategy. And I just don't think you're going to do that and build working class power without a consistent electoral uh, approach. So yeah, I do think the question of emphasis is important because we need to do social movement work, we need to do labor work, uh, but the left hasn't up until recently been doing class struggle elections in this country. And I think that it's clearly uh, been a success for helping us, you know, not just put ourselves on the map, but recruit thousands of people. I'll just end with an anecdote, which I think 5,000 people joined uh, DSA in the week or two after the end of this Bernie campaign. And that's basically more than the total numbers of the far left uh, in this country before Bernie in 2016. Like, joined in one week is more than just anybody on the far left prior to Bernie. And so our expectations have been raised so high that we almost take for granted how much uh, success we've actually already had. And we have a long way to go as far as our composition, but I don't think uh, we should be agnostic about the importance of electoral politics mm. for socialism. Thanks. So, Jamie, I just want to ask a follow-up question to Jamie. You mentioned uh, base building, which is something that I hear, uh, I, I heard the term quite often. I'm, I'm not as sure that I can define it. So I guess I'm wondering um, what, I guess, like, succinctly, what is a base building strategy and what does it do? Whoops, sorry. That was Eric's time. Uh, what, is a, what is a base building strategy and what does it do that, uh, like, not that Eric's advocating electoral only strategy, but what does it do that a uh, sole focus on elections doesn't? Like, what, what, what is it? Well, uh, that's a very good question. Um, a base building strategy basically is building a, an active working class base um, that is politically engaged in a wide variety of ways. And elections can factor into this, right? Because DSA people are going door to door. They're talking to people. They're getting them involved. But I would sort of counterpose it against a more like a party building strategy model where there is a party full of largely inactive members and uh, that pretty much all they do is vote like the Democratic Party. Right. And it's sort of led by a small core of organizers at the top. Um, 
base building involves building um, working class institutions that people participate in and that people trust, right? What is a working class institution? I could think of examples, right? Like tenant unions, um, democratic and militant labor unions, because we know some labor unions are not as good as others, right? They can be a bit a bit top down, a bit bureaucratic, a bit too cozy with capital. Um, things of that nature that give working class people a place to go that um, takes care of their material needs as well as their intellectual needs and really firms up uh, a base of support of people who are activated and participating and engaging in various kinds of class struggle. Mm, thank you. So Eric, you at the end of your comments, you mentioned uh, class struggle elections, which I, I, like, I don't understand. I, it, like, it seems like it's tr also trying to bridge the gap between like putting elections off on one side and putting class, you know, like other forms of organizing, but it seems a little bit of a different approach than base building. Can you talk a little bit about how, you know, what the, the difference might be? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's tricky because I think base building is a pretty uh, general term. Uh, and so it, it can mean different things. The, I think the idea of class struggle elections, specifically what it means is two things. One is that uh, you basically need a socialist to support candidates who are openly siding with the working class against capitalists, you know, calling out the billionaires and who are openly trying to heighten that contradiction and framing things in that way, uh, which is to say that they're supporting the class struggle as opposed to trying to like uh, hide it, which is the case for most Democrats. Uh, and then the second thing is that part of that strategy is to run, not just to win, but consciously trying to use these campaigns to foment class struggle from below, both in the sense of building working class organization, um, and then also in doing things like the Bernie campaign did in supporting strikes, um, in actively using the resources of the campaign and the sort of political uh, platform of running and hopefully winning to foment and support struggles from below. And I guess the strategic difference there uh, between the base building strategy is the level of centrality we think that, and I think that that merits. Um, I just, I think that the history of the socialist movement in this country and other countries um, shows that it's very hard to build the kind of base that I think Jamie and me and most people in DSA want to build. Like, I think we actually all agree on that. We agree on DSA's limitations. I just don't think you can do that without a consistent electoral uh, approach. And uh, that in the past, DSA had an electoral approach that wasn't like a class struggle approach. It was just sort of like supporting left Democrats or not even left Democrats. And so one of the good things about DSA, which is more radical than it used to be, and I think rightly so, is really trying to maintain its independence from the Democratic Party establishment, even when we're forced to run uh, as Democrats on the Democratic Party ballot line. But I think our strategic horizon has to be building our independent institutional strength. Um, and ultimately, that's going to lead to a contradiction with the Democratic Party establishment, in which they'll probably either kick us out or we'll have enough strength to break and we can have our own party. So I think that is the short version of um, class struggle elections. Great, thanks. So you both mentioned uh, labor in your comments. Um, I wanted to sort of move to the second section. You know, it's funny because this is a different, like it's just a different moment than two weeks ago, even a, a little bit in terms of labor for, at least for me. Um, when we were gonna have this panel two weeks ago, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, there's a lot of things that were the same. The COVID pandemic has just made things, you know, uh, crazy. It's, it's extremely difficult to work, you know, to organize your workers when you're not physically with them or when you're on the, you know, uh, risk of, of dying. And there were, so, you know, some, there were a bunch of attempts to, to resist uh, companies with various levels of success. But, you know, one thing that seemed like looming to me, um, you know, my partner is a teacher and I have kids in the school system was that, uh, you know, the teachers union has been leading this revitalization of the labor movement, all with a strike wave over the last few years. And now the works that you're like, and, you know, when we were going to have this meeting two weeks ago, I was looking at this incredibly precarious situation they were going into where you have Andrew Cuomo announcing that he's going to bring in Bill Gates to rethink education and you're trying to force, you know, teachers back to work or to uh, teach remotely and then be replaced by automation, et cetera. But like, it seems like over the last couple of days, there's more talk about, um, 
sorry. Uh, it seems like there's more talk about teachers possibly resisting. I know there's other efforts um, like the Ewok initiative from DSA and others to, to organize workers. Um, I guess I wonder, what, you know, where they see things going in this in the short term. Um, what you know, how do what, what do we think about labor and workplace organizing and, and where does it fit into socialist strategy? Um, Erica, why don't you start with? Yeah, so. What you said is exactly right. I had prepared some comments for two weeks ago and it's different now because the last couple of days, my phone and you know Facebook Messenger has just been popping off because everybody and their mother, uh, whether they're a teacher or their mother's a teacher, uh, is now trying to figure out what's going to happen in the fall. And there is really a, a level and depth of teacher activism in particular that I haven't seen on a national level, period. Um, there's been, obviously, teachers have been at the fore of the, you know, uh, strike movements that we've seen since 2018 in West Virginia, Los Angeles, Chicago, elsewhere. But this is so broad. It just over and over again, anecdotally, I have friends reaching out to me uh, saying, you know, my aunt, who is a Trump voter, is organizing her building to strike if they try to make people go back. So this is happening all over the country as we speak. It's really, we, we, we don't even have a sense uh, of how deep it is because it's so much of it is being sort of self-organized over social media. Uh, and I think that all of the signs indicate that at least when it comes to education, the fall is going to be very explosive and we're already seeing a deep amount of mobilization and it's exacerbated because Trump is making the reopening of schools like part of his desperate culture war attempt. Uh, and it's, it's just like many things he's doing today, stupid and going to be counterproductive. Uh, but it also puts the question of education and schools back at the fore of national politics, which I think is ultimately favorable to us because it, in education is one of the few parts of the working class in which there's a relatively strong uh, union movement in which there's a precedent of militancy in which you have um, a good number of radicals pushing towards the kind of bottom up class struggle unionism that we need for the whole class. And so I am really inspired by it what's happening right now. I think that it's part of the general trend uh, that is still very incipient. You know, labor, we're still, for the most part, getting our asses kicked by the billionaires, like just to be real. Um, and there isn't a strike wave in industry as a whole. We have seen, even compared to other countries though, a pretty significant uh, amount of bottom-up organizing um, to in response to the pandemic. I think now that there is going to be these back and forth reopenings, you're going to see a lot more workplace action. Again, like we saw in the initial uh, move towards the shutdowns, because people I just aren't going to be willing to die for their employers, they're just point blank. And that leads to a situation, especially now that the strike is something that people vaguely know is a possibility that gives us the possibility, though far from the inevitability, of pushing towards the kind of militancy we need. That being said, Mass unemployment, uh, economic crises historically are not good for labor organizing. It, like the, in, during the depression last time, it was only when things started getting better that labor organizing was able to pick up. It's possible that the depth of this crisis and the sort of unprecedented nature means that despite that, we could see labor upsurge, but it's gonna be hard when people are looking for work and especially now when a lot of people are isolated, it's not easy to do workplace organizing. Uh, that being said, we're seeing it happening around education and it gives us at least some model for what we can hopefully do uh, in other industries as well. Thanks. Jamie, what do you think? Well, um, I agree with uh, most of what Eric said. Um, on the one hand, we're seeing some pretty bad conditions for workers to say the least um in many cases workers have even less leverage as more and more people become unemployed and fall into this sort of underemployed gig worker realm uh with hyper exploitative firms like amazon um amazon just went on a huge hiring spree as if to let its workers know that they are replaceable at the same time that their workers are fighting the boss and organizing a union. Shout out to the Amazon union. Um, I'm really impressed by what these folks are doing. Um, people are pushing back, including in fields that are not 
traditionally unionized or haven't been in quite some time. Um, we've seen some really inspiring organizing by workers at Amazon, like I said, Instacart, Whole Foods, Tyson Food Plants, and elsewhere, striking for paid sick leave, uh, safe for working conditions. Uh, workers at one factory struck for the right to make PPE in their factory, which I think shows that the, that communal impulse is there in people. You know, when the shit hits the fan, people generally want to help each other out. Um, public sympathy is largely on the worker's side in a way that we don't always necessarily see, right? The pandemic has done us a pretty cool service, actually, by creating a thing called essential workers. And these are jobs that were previously seen in many cases as low-skilled and unimportant. And I think people are starting to realize, oh, these are actually the people whose work is helping everyone else stay alive. Maybe we should pay them more, um, especially when you know middle-class parents are forced to work from home and take care of their kids at the same time, right? Uh, we've all seen the posts about how they think now that teachers should get paid more. And I would hope that they feel the same way about like the people who clean their houses, the people who deliver them food, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's also just showing people the contradictions in our economic system, right? We're seeing that the amount of labor or work needed to provide all of the necessities for people to keep on living is much, much lower than the amount of work that people are actually doing, right? This goes back to David Graeber's idea of bullshit jobs. But also, the economy collapses when people lose their bullshit jobs. So what's up with that? Um, maybe it's a bad thing that we cannot pause production and consumption for one week or one month to save you know, untold numbers of lives without throwing the world into a deep and spiraling crisis. So on that grander scale, uh, I'm hoping that it has some ripple effects in terms of both labor organizing and organizing around the right to resist work or resist um, unsatisfying or underpaid work. And um, hopefully, too, people are realizing the need for some kind of worldwide public health network that may not be possible under capitalism. I realize I'm going a little far afield with this, but it's been extremely on my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I guess I have, so like, I just have one question for uh, both of you for, for a quick follow-up is the, you know, uh, I mean, the, the question of solidarity is so important, especially when, you know, uh, you know, we, we, we have not had strong unions in this country for so long. We haven't had a union movement. So like solidarity has been critical in Chicago and all these teacher strikes, you have to have the public on, on, on the side of workers and you have to have multiple different industries going to bat for each other. Um, I feel like the potential could go either way. You know, like, obviously we're all in a boat together where we think things are terrible. And I think, you know, what Jamie's saying is right. That, people are realizing what the actual essential labor is. It's also the case that, you know, I'm a parent um, in the New York school system and it's really tough because they're presenting us with a, 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 a real, a false choice between saying like teachers should go into these, you know, terrible working conditions or, or you or the workers all have to stay home. Right. It's like, it's very difficult. It, it, I guess it, like the, the, the potential exists for solidarity. The barriers also exist there too, because uh, they're, you know, they're starving us uh, uh, of resources. It's not like saying they're, they're giving us the option, should kids go back to school or should we have a fully funded um, child care system and should we, you know, the teachers have all the, the you know, the same working conditions for about remotely. So I guess I wonder for both of you, what do you think, like, and it puts us socialists in a funny position. I mean, what, what do you think we can do right now, given all of the uncertainty and the, the health issues and, and everything? Um, Erica, uh, what do you think? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think that um, one of the things we need to do is call for like a national bailout out of public services. And uh, part of that would be basically providing things like childcare and necessary um, services for those who have to go to work but who uh, their kids might not be in schools. And, and so this is a, the type of demand that is like very much beyond what the current political discourse is talking about. But I think 
it doesn't mean it's going to be easy to win and it, it might be I, actually it will be very hard to win but i think we need to raise it because exactly what you said um we need to get out of this false dilemma which is on the one hand uh go back because we're basically we need to go back to work um for financial reasons or we need to stay home for health reasons and so the, the way to get out of that dilemma is through a massive uh, influx of money, both so that people, A, if they need to, can stay at home um, by, for instance, extending unemployment benefits, things like that, um, and also just making it so that the school system doesn't um, have to serve the function it is right now, which is like a childcare uh, repository for so many working class folks. Moreover, the danger in the fall is not just the um, question that we were discussing, but also with the economic crisis that we're uh, in the midst of, we're talking about like unprecedented austerity and budget cuts to the school system and all public services. So I think that even of just on that question alone, our responsibility as socialists and activists in general needs to call on the federal government to cough up the money necessary to bail out the people. And I think if we frame it that way, it could catch on. Um, it, you know, we saw, when it came to bailing out uh, big business, both you know, after the Great Recession and just recently, all of a sudden, billions of dollars, boom, overnight, they're able to you know, sign the check, no issue. And so people saw that. I don't think they forget that. The problem is that people's expectations are low, and so we need to try to raise them. Um, and I think that the strikes uh, that hopefully are to come and the type of organizing we do will raise that possibility uh, for you know, winning, hopefully. Yeah, Jamie, same question to you. What do you think? Oh, man. I mean, <laughs> I want to be hopeful about our ability to organize around basic social democratic demands. But we have seen uh, how just utterly resistant to anything like that um, the people in power are. And they're fresh off a win that they didn't even have to try that hard to achieve, right? So Pelosi and Schumer and company are probably getting a little bit cocky in terms of their ability to resist us. Uh, that said, we should certainly keep trying. Um, the moment has really endorsed a socialist... I, I won't say socialist because these are still, um, you know, things that can be carried out under capitalism. But certainly uh, social democratic policies have been endorsed by the reality that we're currently seeing. So um, organizing to cancel rent would be a pretty important demand, especially as uh, the housing courts start to reopen again. We're going to see a wave of evictions if uh, nothing is done. Um, a universal basic income, paying people to stay home, right? I feel like this is a controversial idea in general on the left, but certainly during a global pandemic, I think it makes a whole lot of sense. Um, universal health care, duh. <laughs> it's, it's fucking disgusting that um, Joe Biden looked A.D. Barkan in the face the other day uh, and basically told him to fuck off when he asked him if he supports Medicare for all. Um, and we need to be giving money to schools because schools have a really difficult job right now. They have a really difficult choice in front of them, right? Do we uh, stay closed and risk um, just developmentally damaging young school children in a way that they might never recover from? Um, or do we reopen and risk uh, putting people in harm's way, especially teachers? Um, now, I don't have a perfect answer to this quandary, but it would certainly help if there was some sort of coordinated effort, right? Like we're talking today about this on the majority report. They could have school outside. Um, they could have school outside during the warmer months. They could set up tents with heaters in them to have school outside in colder times. But all of this requires coordination and all of this requires money. And I just don't see any help coming. So these are demands that people really need to be organizing around right now, in addition to you know the incredible wave of organizing against um, the racist police state.
And these things mm-hmm. are certainly connected in the larger fight. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I, you know, I'm glad that you mentioned, uh, you know, the Black, Black Lives Matter 2.0 or the, the new iteration, because I wanted to sort of move into social movements and out- organizing outside the workplace, which Jamie touched on a little bit. Um, I, I think, you know, what, what you said earlier about uh, understanding the impact of something in retrospect, um, I think that's a helpful way to think about things. Certainly in terms of social movements where they can just explode in the United States and then disappear. And then you're not sure what's changed. I mean, I think it's clear that like Occupy Wall Street definitely changed people's understanding of, you know, inequality in the country. Uh, The first Black Lives Matter movement, you know, had a huge impact. Me too. You know, the current iteration of Black Lives Matter has, you know, literally had more mobilizations, I think, than any other in history. Um, And then, you know, so, but we can look, like we can look back at certain things and have a criticism or, um, you know, or try to fit, or, or but but we see that how these things sort of build on to, to one another, um, and I wonder about uh, you know social movement organizing and like I feel like it's come up in in both of the previous questions, but you know how does how does social movement organizing fit um, uh, into a socialist uh, into a socialist strategy? Um, Jamie, what do you think? Well, um, I think it is extremely important, especially because the demand for labor is dropping worldwide. Um, I, I read a pretty convincing pair of articles from Aaron Banana for the New Left Review that you guys should check out if you want to. And he made a pretty convincing case for the fact that um, the demand for labor, particularly the kind of productive industrial labor that drove the post-war boom is dropping not just in the US, but all over the place, right? This is a secular worldwide process and it has less to do with outsourcing and automation than it does with the tendency of the rate of profit to fall over time, right? So what does that mean? for our organ our traditional forms of organizing um it means that you know in addition to organizing in the traditional workplace we need to be organizing outside of it in the realm of social reproduction um basically everything that working class people do outside of the formal workplace that uh, reproduces themselves from day to day and from generation to generation as a class, everything from you know eating, sleeping, taking care of kids, having kids, etc. Um, so, I think we're going to see more and more importance around um, not only the uh, the service sector, right? Because when people are are no longer needed by the uh, traditional productive uh, like factories and whatnot. Um, they fall into the service sector and they're very underpaid. So that's um, really important. But also stuff like housing, um, food, uh, the price of goods, circulation, right? Um, Where's that going with this? Yeah. um, And I think that connects up too with the idea of the riot. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this and reading about it lately and trying to kind of uh, theorize the riot not just as like, a, oh, it's so sad, you know, the riots are the language of the unheard. People don't have uh, any way to express themselves. They're, they're, they're doing destructive things. No, like riots, riots are good. Hot take. Um, like Joshua Clover wrote about it in his book, uh, Riot Strike Riot, Riot, Strike Riot, as sort of the, um, the other side of the coin to the strike. Right. If the strike is people setting the price of labor, uh, riot is setting the price of goods. And um, when you don't have a job um, and you cannot access the basic necessities of life, um, except by accessing a wage first, um, you're going to be pretty concerned about the prices, price of goods. Um, So that was a bit of a digression. But um, where was it? I'm sorry. I totally lost my train of thought. Um, yeah. So struggles outside of the workplace are going to be very important, which is not to say that labor should not get involved. I think labor needs to get a lot more involved in the movement for black lives and connecting the dots in between, um, you know, white supremacy, uh, the prison industrial complex and capitalist exploitation. Um, 
We're seeing the centrality of struggles around so-called identity politics to the larger fight against capitalism, right? Like, um, and, and fights for political rights, right? Not only economic rights, but political rights. Um, like, again, I'm going to quote Joshua Clover when he said the economy is far, the state is close. Um, the boot of the state is on people's necks and you can only squeeze people so far before they start to fight back. Um, it benefits capital to have a segmented working class, right? Divided by race, nationality. Um, leftists have understood this for much of our history. The Communist Party from the 1920s on had an industrial strategy led by black workers. The Black Panthers in the 1960s had a really complete understanding of how capitalism and white supremacy work together to um, keep everyone down. Um, and we're not going to solve uh, racist oppression solely through unions and elections. Um, we've seen something resembling social democracy before, and it was largely predicated based on the exclusion of women and black workers, as well as immigrants, as well as exploitation of the global south. So I think it, it's, it's understandable why people would want to look back to the past, to these old, uh, these old tactics that have worked and to the golden age of capitalism, um, right? A lot of the signature policies that famous socialists are fighting for are named after things from the past, right? The, the Green New Deal, for example. But we also need to be looking forward to a world beyond the wage system and um, kind of build... A, fighting universalism from all of these particular struggles, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. Uh, uh, Jamie. Uh, Eric, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I would say that social movements and you know, street protests and different uh, non-electoral, non-labor organizing is just clearly a very essential part of struggle for social justice in this country and in the world. You know, the most obvious example recently being the uprisings for black lives. So I don't think that's uh, in question. Uh, millions of people radicalized through uh, taking to the streets. The, I think the more salient question maybe for us to discuss um, is, well, what do we do as socialists in relation to social movements? You know, it's, it's not enough just to say they're good because they are good. Um, and I think the big, you know, $64,000 question that we, have to confront um, is how do we, uh, as socialists and just as participants in, in these movements, you know, including for uh, Black Lives Matter, how do we try to fight to give a better organized expression to the social movements? Because the the, the rhythm of recent social movements in, in this country, at least, but also maybe throughout the world to a certain extent, um, but particularly here, has been you just have these explosions and then people go home. And that's not always the case with social movements. Uh, you know, it, the, the obvious example, counterexample would be the civil rights movement, which, you know, lasted, you know, for over a decade, had very strong uh, organizational component. But that, that hasn't been the case with the recent social movements in this country. I'm thinking about the anti-war movement uh, sort of dissipating, the immigrant rights uh, movement 20, uh, in 2006, you know, general strike, it was massive. Um, but not leaving the sort of organizational residue that can build a sustained working class movement. And then uh, it becomes difficult because then you have to reinvent the wheel. So you can change the discourse, but if you aren't able to um, sort of cohere yourselves organizationally, it's very hard to um, build the type of power we need and change the relationships of force with capital. So I do think that our role as socialists is not just to go and participate, but to try to find ways um, to help uh, organize. And that's difficult, uh, for instance, in the current movement, because DSA is a disproportionately white organization, um, and that is a real limitation. But I think the way we're going to change that is in part by um, trying to impart some of the lessons from the past and working with uh, comrades and different organizations to show that, uh, you know, we're serious about building power and fighting racism. Um, and I think that the maybe one thing that we've seen through the recent period and, and throughout history is I'm skeptical of the possibility for social movements sort of on their own to bring the type of uh, deep transformation that we need. I, I, like I, for instance, take the example of defunding the police. I, I think it's going to be very hard to do that with just street protests. And, and if you have just street protests, it lends itself to eventually getting co-opted 
uh, into, you know, the Democratic Party saying, okay, well, there's only so long you can stay in the streets, so come vote for us and we'll do some, you know, small chinking around the edges. So what would it actually take to defund the police? Well, I don't think you can do that with just street protesting. We need those. But even we've seen recently, it's hard to sustain that past a few weeks. Uh, we should continue as much as we can. But you do need to have more of an organizational presence. And I think that the type of um, examples that we saw, for instance, ILW, the Longshoremen's Union, uh, shutting down uh, the West Coast uh, in support of Black Lives, that type of like political social leverage um, is going to be necessary. So I do think you need to combine social movements with labor and electoral politics, just to be honest, who is going to put forward the legislation calling to defund the police? You can be in the streets, but if you don't have representatives of the movement uh, who are openly antagonistic against the system, I don't think that we're going to be able to like continue the type of movement we need until the point that we can have the power to actually defend the police and fund the things that we actually need, like schools, healthcare, all of that. So uh, social movements are important, but I think ultimately to win, they're going to have to link up with a strong labor movement. And I, you know, we don't have the time to go into it here, but I do think that that clearly there's been a recomposition of the working class that's made it. So it's not like the factory worker um, is the central part of the class in the way it used to, but I think that shouldn't lead us to uh, discount the necessity and possibility for trying to recohere organized labor as sort of like a central pillar for our transformational project. And just to give the example of the Green New Deal, like we are gonna need a lot of labor to save this country and this world from getting uh, you know, pulverized by climate change. And so if we're able to tie the social movements and labor to the fight for climate justice, which has racial, economic, social justice component, I do think that that lets the possibility for uh, rebuilding like labor in conjecture social movements in a way that will be ultimately uh, anti-capitalist in nature. Thanks, Eric. Um, so I just wanna ask a quick follow-up question to both of you and then uh, we'll kick it open. We have a few questions that came in on the chat that I'll read. So um, Jimmy, and you should correct me if I'm wrong. It's, it sounded like uh, your emphasis is on social movements and that labor would play a supporting role. And like, uh, you know, as, as a Marxist, that's a very challenging Thing for me, you know, as someone who is, you know, raised politically to think that, you know, labor is the source of all power, et cetera, that the, the way we would win things is by you know, striking and withholding the profits. It see, it see, uh, it, you know, it seems to me that you're suggesting that um, that socialists put, should put more energy into into social movements. Uh, maybe that's wrong. I, I don't know. I just maybe you, you clarify that. Or, but if that's the case, then um, I guess how? To, um, what's the mechanism of 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 like bending capital to 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 the to to, to do what the workers need? I mean, we saw a real change happen in Minneapolis, right? They're disbanding their police department. We'll see what happens with that. Um, not as a result of getting the right person elected. They burned that police station down, right? This, this feels like some a step forward in human achievements, right? It's like when somebody uh, breaks a new record for running a mile and then people realize everywhere else that they can do it too. But um, in terms of my, my theory of change, um, I, I guess it's important to keep in mind what our horizon is, right? Uh, my horizon is not merely a kind of worker state it is one where people have the ability to refuse work if they don't want to do it. I um, want to give a shout out to the welfare rights movement, which was a movement outside of the traditional workplace uh, led by mostly black and brown women, moms saying, hey, um, we're never going to be empowered by the kind of jobs that we can get in this society. And we're doing work already reproducing ourselves, um, having kids, sending these kids off to die in Vietnam, right? Because this movement happened in the 60s and 70s. Um, were they running people in elections? No, they were sitting, they were occupying welfare offices and demanding to be compensated for their social reproductive labor. And, you know, beyond that, just by virtue of their humanity, they were like, we deserve a basic level of subsistence. So it's, it's, not, it's not totally clear to me how change is going to happen this time around, but uh, I think it can happen 
all sorts of different ways. But in order to see like the real kinds of changes, right, not just reforms, not just social democratic reforms within the capitalist system, but like actually overthrowing the bosses, right? I, I, sh I should be clear about what I believe in as a socialist, labor, wage labor, private property, the state, and ultimately uh, the nation state, like borders themselves, they all gotta go. Um, so I guess I, I try to keep that in mind when I'm thinking about these various questions, because some of these roots are more circuitous than others. Um, but, but I will admit there's like kind of a split within the left and anti-work politics are sort of controversial, right? Because some workers derive, uh, you know, pleasure and identity from doing their jobs and other people are like, fuck work. It's terrible. Yeah. I don't want to do it. Therefore, I'm a communist. People have different roads to it. But um, I think if we're talking about the kind of like the, the eyes on the prize that uh, that I'm talking about, it's going to it's going to it's going to be violent. Basically, it's going to require uh, it's probably going to be really scary and horrible for many, many years, which is going to happen anyway as we slide into, you know, crisis and fascism. But like at a certain point, it seems a little circuitous to like um, get people to care about electoral politics first so that we can later build a base to overthrow the bourgeois state itself. You know what I mean? Thanks. I feel um, like I'm so rambling Eric terribly, but oh. that's all right. Oh, no, no, I appreciate it. Um, Eric, I guess I want to ask sort of the inverse question to you. Um, so like, you know, especially, so we, so all of our lives, the three of the people on this panel, we've lived in a moment of, you know, labor being historically weak. It seems like each year labor is more historically weak than it was before. And so, you know, these movements like, you know, Me Too, or, you know, these movements that raise these demands um, that, you know, that, that speak to huge numbers of people, I think it's, it's, it seems hard for me to imagine a labor movement popping off that suddenly takes like, like an anti, like the anti-harassment union campaign at a small workplace that catches fire, et cetera. So I guess I like the question to you is like, you know, uh, you know, if you, you know, even if we do accept that labor is the source of all power and that we should strike in which, you know, I, I, I do, but like, how do we use unions as a vehicle to win things like that are, you know, these, these, these social movements, like how, or how do we wield labor, you know, to, to some of these bigger questions that, that Jamie's getting at? Yeah. I mean, I think, in some ways, that's not a new question. I, I, I'm not, I, I don't think it's the case that um, labor unions have always just sort of been focused on uh, narrowly on their own members. Like sometimes that's been the case and sometimes not. Historically, labor unions that have been led by leftists and socialists, particularly in other countries, but in this country also before McCarthyism kicked us all out of our organizations and the you know labor movement, unions and socialists led uh, working class organizations have always fought uh, for the type of social justice struggles that continue to be central. So whether it's the question about um, housing rights, whether it's the question of the fight against white supremacy, fight for women's rights, like all of these issues are not new to capitalism. Uh, the newest thing is climate change. And I, I do think that is like a very novel um, threat but also an opportunity because, as I mentioned before, the um, just the imperatives for such dramatic social transformation to stave off like catastrophe means that we have um, this opening to make a case for um, really systematic transformation. And I just I don't see how you do that without um, a strong organized labor movement. And so I think climate change is a perfect example because if you know if we're going to win that, we need to have power. What labor unions do better, I think, than any other non-electoral uh, form of organization is help working class people have power and sustained organizational power. I think that's, the, you know, that, that's not just in you know, private factories, but think about teachers. Teachers clearly have power uh, and that's not going away, right? And I think part of the difficulty I have with this narrative of like labor being um, you know, a little bit passe because of changes in industry is it actually discounts the importance of like female led industries like healthcare 
and public education right now, which are at the fore of the labor movement. And we should champion that. And rather than thinking that like workplace um, struggle is passe, I think let's say like, look at the centrality of essential workers like healthcare uh, nurses and teachers right now. And let's use that type of power. Let's have healthcare workers, teachers, like help rebuild a labor movement for us all. And that's going to require, I do think, uh, making demands for social democratic reforms. I don't think we're going to be able to get to the kind of like anti-capitalist rupture that we need. Because I, I agree with you, um, Jamie, that, you know, our horizon has to be uh, beyond capitalism. And I, I think we need a revolution in this country. Um, that being said, I don't see how Hell you yeah. get there without a, with a, without a massively transformed working class uh, as far as in terms of our organization. And I think part of building that organization is going to be winning the types of structural reforms that can help us rebuild our class, right? So if you can imagine, for instance, uh, a Green New Deal, it's not important just because of the changes for uh, climate change, but because of creating millions of new union jobs, imagine the type of leverage that will give us to fight for even more. And so I do think that uh, to get to the kind of like anti-capitalist rupture we need, uh, that's going to require labor organizing and it's going to require fight for big social democratic uh, demands. So, uh, so I, uh, thanks both. Um, this is a very useful discussion, very enlightening for me. I think, it, you know, uh, we touched on a bunch of things. We have a few questions from the audience that uh, I want to kick. One is on the Green New Deal, which I feel like is germane since we're talking about it. Um, Jamie, um, I guess, uh, I guess I'll start with you, but like the, the Green New Deal, like how, you know, uh, like it's, there's a lot of priorities that we have in front of us that I think a lot of people feel are uh, priority number one that are really important. You know, and many people argue, I think, quite convincingly that the that the environment ought to be that number one thing. Um, you know, uh, and there's a lot of traction in some places and in, in some places there isn't. I'm wondering, what, you know, what um, I guess it's a similar question to the others. Like, how, you know, where would you put uh, organize, organizing for the environment? Um, on you know the sort of the list of priorities which socialists should be making right now, and uh, as a subset, where um, is the Green New Deal the way to fight that? Are there is there is there another, or is there something else that that we should be doing? Well, I think the Green New Deal is certainly a very good start. Um, we need better jobs, like Eric said. We need uh, to save the earth from climate change. Um, and it will require like a real reorganizing of our economy in hopefully a more socialist direction. Although I am somewhat afraid that capitalism actually does have the ability to solve climate change. Um, and then where will we be after that? We just lost one of our really great arguments against capitalism. Um, I think the Green New Deal could go further in certain areas. Um, I really liked the proposal for a Red New Deal that passed at the DSA convention this past year that was worked on um, in part by indigenous uh, activists like um, Red Nation. Uh, I think it's really important to take indigenous struggles into account. Um, and that connects up to so many things in this settler colonial society, right? But if you wanna look at um, the struggle around Standing Rock, um, this was a, a clear cut instance of how um, concerns about the environment uh, really dovetail with concerns about the rights of indigenous people to the land that has been uh, stolen from them. But um, Oh, God, I'm looking at the chat and it's really distracting. Um, <laughs> that said, like, we will hit a limit at some point to the amount of uh, the amount of juice that we can get out of these programs, especially when um, as long as the, we rely on extracting raw materials from places like Bolivia to put in our solar cells, you know, as long as uh, we're still having a predatory relationship with countries in the global south, um, the, uh, uh, the amount of progress that can be achieved by the Green New Deal is going to be highly limited. I think we need to get really internationalist in scope and really rethink how we organize um, both production and consumption in the world. Mm. Um, Eric, do you want to add anything to that? 
Well, I mean, I, I spoke about the Green New Deal a, a bunch already. I, I'll just add that I think the COVID crisis provides an opportunity for making the case to people for the Green New Deal again in a compelling way. The first being like, um, if we ignore this threat of climate change, it's going to be similar to the way the threat of the coronavirus and COVID-19 was uh, ignored and then look where that got us. So I think there's a newfound like trust in science, which is good, science is good. Um, <laughs> and that we want people to understand the extent to which we're all interconnected. And so that's become more clear because of COVID. The second thing that's become more clear because of COVID that's related to climate change is our capacity as a society and as societies to make drastic changes when necessary. So it's like, if we could shut down for this public health reason, why can't we do really basic things that will save millions of people's lives around climate change? And so there's that the kind of um, interruption of daily life is, has the, the, an, uh, you know, uh, the possibility for uh, helping people imagine how we could interrupt daily life in a positive way. That's not inevitable, but you know, when people are just going through their routine, it's hard to make the case for something like climate change, which can seem abstract. But now uh, I think it might feel a little bit more immediate. Um, so, I, uh, you know, Jamie mentioned internationalism, which is a, it's a big question and we, it was one that we don't actually talk about very often. Um, you know, uh, there was a question in the chat from Rory about this. Um, so thanks for the question, Rory. Um, I guess I want, you know, it's basically about how to make a socialist movement in, international, which I think is, is a huge question. I, I feel like, you know, working in Jacobin, we publish a lot of stuff on international and I think that, there, you know, there's a huge uh, like a, a sizable reach for that, but as a drop off, you know, you look at the, you know, we look at the audience, um, the American audience doesn't, you know, know oftentimes what's happening, uh, you know, around the world. It's, so it's a real challenge to like inform and understand the stakes, which, you know, is it, like, that's like a very elemental level of, of international solidarity. How, you know, given all the, the challenges and stuff that we're talking about domestically, how do either of you see building a, 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 an international movement? Um, if anybody, if anybody wants to start first, to... Jamie, do you want to go? Hmm. I mean, that's <laughs> a really big question, and uh, yeah. I really wish I had more answers to it because, um, you know, I'd be putting them into practice right now. I think we definitely need to be educating ourselves and pushing even friendly electeds like Bernie Sanders on issues of U.S. imperialism around the world. Um, he's certainly better than better than most electeds for sure, but he could still be better. Um, I'm trying to think of some examples here. Uh, we should definitely organize against uh, sanctions on Cuba. I think that's something uh, all socialists can agree on. Um, we should be organizing against um, coups of leaders in places like Venezuela and Bolivia and just doing more to put pressure on our government because that's the place where we can exert the most pressure um, against uh, imperialist policies around the world. Yeah, I would just add, I agree with that. I would add that, you know, the US left, even though we've grown, you know, significantly in the last couple of years, we're so far behind uh, strategically and just in our politics, most of, or at least a lot of other countries in the world. Like that's, I've always felt that we've had, we have so much more to learn from our comrades in other countries than we're usually aware of. And, and that's, um, that's important because we don't just need to like reinvent the wheel every single time uh, that we organize. And so because there's stronger left in other parts of the world, it means that we can talk to them, for instance, about the contradictions of having a socialist in parliament or Congress, right? About how did they uh, rebuild militant trade unionism? What were the tensions? And so for me, just that kind of more organic uh, sharing of experiences is important. Also, because we do have something to contribute, um, you know, the recent American left uh, resurgence is something that socialists across the world are very, very excited about because I think they understand something that a lot of us maybe underestimate, which is that um, as long as this country's government is in power, no struggles for real systematic social justice in the world are safe. 
And so they understand that their fates are intertwined with everything we do. And if anything, they probably have a better sense than we do of just like uh, how important it is that we get our act together as an American left. So people, are, they're excited. Whenever I talk to comrades abroad, they're like excited that we actually have a left now, which we didn't uh, a few years ago. Um, and I think that that bodes well for the coming years in which, you know, the crisis is not going anywhere. And we don't know where the kind of like impetus for inspiration will come. But certainly there's a feedback loop both uh, here and abroad that we can lean on. Hell yeah, I agree with all of that. Um, also, I've been thinking a lot about um, international unions and labor organizing and how um, capital is fully globalized. These giant corporations are fully globalized and the fight against them needs to be as well. So I would love to see something like that happen in the coming years. Amen. Um, okay, so I want to bring it back as a last question to wrap up and sort of ask the question I've been asking over and over again, which is what should socialists do? Um, you know, we are constantly, you know, uh, we're a large organization, but we're still strapped for, you know, resources and certain, you know, there's much more work to be done than we could possibly do. So um, what, you know, given all the things that we've talked about and the balance of, you know, that we want to incorporate some of these things and, you know, more than others, et cetera, what, what do each of you think, you know, going forward for the short term in, in, in 20, you know, the next year or two, whatever, as, as we um, try to grow DSA and build struggle, what should we be what should socialists be doing? Well, like, what are the the, the top priorities, that, the ways that, that socialists should be spending their time? Um, Jamie, uh, what do you think? Are you asking what is to be done? <laughs> what is to be done? Uh, yeah, so I'll try to be really concrete here because I feel like I wandered off into galaxy brain territory a little bit before. I'm gonna <laughs> gonna bring it home. Um, I think. Uh, a party-like organization or a party of parties, perhaps, because, you know, the U.S. is so large and diverse, um, is probably going to be important, right? Um, something that provides for people's needs, both intellectual needs in terms of political ed, um, social needs, right? It's very hard to separate um, the political from the social. Um, we need to be integrating politics into every aspect of people's lives. Um, Cause the right, the right's doing it right. Um, Sad hater used the example of like everyone you play golf with is also like a rich capitalist Republican piece of shit or whatever. Um, regrow the bonds of community that have been destroyed by capitalism or, you know, maybe never existed to begin with in this country. Um, the, the idea of the party is something I keep coming back to, um, despite being sort of a, a more anarchist adjacent type of communist. Um, I think Lenin had some really good points about the party as a body that sort of organizes um, with and as the working class. And really, um, there's a push and pull where the party, uh, the parties like professional militants or whatever the cadre learns from the wisdom of the masses and teaches them at the same time. Um, and it needs to be like a really collaborative uh, process, you know, not just people dictating down to the masses from on high. That's never going to work. So we need to ask ourselves, you know, what what could we do to even begin to play that role for people and have that kind of legitimacy um, in their lives, whether it's for uh, through mutual aid. Like I really like looking back on the Black Panthers breakfast program is one really powerful example of that or uh, or whatever. I don't have all the answers to that either, but um, I think that's going to be necessary. Also, um, Mike Davis noted the other night, and I agree with him, we need youth organizations. We need to start them young. Um, young people are especially fucked in this economy um, that may or may not always translate to political activity. Maybe it just translates into like cool TikToks or whatever, but I think the kids are all right and they certainly have more energy than I do to <laughs> get out in the streets, fuck shit up spend a ton of time on organizing Zoom calls, etc. cetera. Um, we need to be doing coalition work as the organized left, forming coalitions with um, radical groups led by all different kinds of people, but especially um, people of color, black and brown youth are doing 
so much right now and we really need to be doing more coalition work than we are now and with radical groups, not only groups from the NGO sector or, um, you know, the Working Families Party or what have you. Um, and we need to get a lot more internationalist in scope, which, you know, previously discussed, not easy, but um, very necessary if we're going to build a worldwide movement that connects up all of these different particular struggles into one struggle against a common enemy. Yeah. Thanks. So Eric, what is to be done? Yeah, well, I think we should be ambitious uh, because that's what the moment uh, makes possible and necessary. And not just because things are bad, but because there is a real radicalization in this country um, that was manifest in the Bernie campaigns, manifest in the Black Lives Matter protests. I think I'm in the short term pretty optimistic that if uh, Trump loses, you're going to see people taking to the streets to call on Biden to pass Medicare for All, Green New Deal, uh, defunding the police, that they'll really 2021 could be a very um, explosive year. So that's the context which in, in which I think it is possible to rebuild a mass working class movement in this country and to have DSA become what it isn't, which is a truly, um, you know, an organization that's reflective of the multiracial working class that is radicalized, but it was still mostly disconnected from DSA, which uh, tends to have recruited people in a kind of self-selecting manner. People, you know, hear about it from friends or, or social media. But uh, if DSA starts organizing campaigns uh, and really doing real organizing um, work, that's going to mean that we're able to recruit different types of people who are joining because we've made a difference in their lives. And that is going to be the way that we become a, a mouthpiece and really an organic part of the broader working class. And I think that there's historically and still today two main ways we can do that. Um, it's not to the exclusion of other things, but I do think that um, in practice you always prioritize. And I think that we should be prioritizing two main things, uh, which are broad, but um, one is labor and the second is electoral politics. I think that these are like two strategic axes through which uh, we can recohere a strong socialist movement. Um, concretely, what does that look like? So as far as labor goes, we've already seen uh, the strike is back in this country. There's talking uh, about, again, now with teachers, uh, it could be another strike wave. Um, and so much of the possibility though is squandered because unfortunately we just don't have uh, a lot of socialists in the types of workplaces and unions in which we could really do what's happening in education, which we're already seeing the role that relatively small groups of radicals can play in helping their coworkers fight back. Imagine if we had thousands of socialists in uh, transport, right? And UPS right now, just think about the sen strategic centrality of UPS um, and logistics uh, in the pandemic, but just also in general, in healthcare, um, in education. If you think just those three industries, and I think there's other ones too, think about if we had thousands of socialists helping transform those industries, making them militant, and then the way that that could inspire other workers across the board to fight back similarly, right? So that means getting involved in organizing the unorganized in a lot of these industries where um, there aren't organized workers, but also means transforming the unions that we have so that they can be uh, a avenues to organize on a mass scale that we don't have the resources resources for and be an inspiration for other workers to fight back. And we've seen through teacher strikes what that can look like. Uh, I think that I agree with Jamie, like the, my, all my hope is really in the youth. And so some, uh, which is to say that like YDSA, our young uh, Democratic Social America is already amazing. Uh, and actually is much more multiracial and, and I think a different class composition. Um, and I think that that bodes well, both for the possibilities for YDSA to be a conduit for this type of labor revitalization, but also for our electoral work. Um, I think that imagine what we just saw in New York um, and in, in Chicago, where you have a socialist uh, caucus with multiple uh, socialist aldermen in New York. Now we have, have a strong socialist presence in Albany. Imagine if you could replicate that across the country and start making real, even if it's small, reforms in people's lives and using those avenues electorally to build a mass base, right, in, in workplaces, in neighborhoods. Um, and I think that if you're able to start racking up these victories, that's going to be mm. what we need to help raise expectations, help use those to build mass struggles, help be a voice for the social movements that we see in the like halls of power so that the demands don't get co-opted. And if you can have a reciprocal effect between labor politics, between electoral politics and social movements. And ultimately, I think that's going to mean requiring 
our own party. That's like a long-term vision, but it's going to be necessary to build the power we need. And I think winning like a social democratic welfare state would be such a huge uh, sense of transformation and rebuilding our power that will be a step towards the type of anti-capitalist rupture that we need to save uh, you know, humanity in the long term and, and exploitation, racism, and sexism. So that's the long-term vista that I think we should all aspire to. There's nothing more meaningful given the kind of horrors of the capitalist system than fighting for that. And if there's anybody like on the call right now who's not yet involved, you should join DSA, you should get involved uh, in your local organizing, whatever it is, uh, keep on going to the protest for Black Lives Matter. And like now is a really amazing uh, and important time to become a socialist if you're not yet. That's right. Can I say one more thing that I forgot? Sure. I know, I'm so chaotic today. Um, I think abolitionism also cannot be understated as something that is not just a side project to the socialist movement. It's not just uh, a, an identity politics thing. It's not just an ethnic problem, but it is central to the fight against capital and the state. Um, and it's, it's, it's really complicated, the, the, the connections and the material factors tying together um, capitalism white supremacy and the prison industrial complex and the police. But I think, you know, we're always saying we need to meet people where they are. And right now, a lot of people are thinking and talking about the police as an institution. And it seems like a very good chance for the socialist left to connect the dots because, you know, not everybody who's participating in this movement is a leftist right now. But once you start to look at the role that um, the police play in this society, it points in inevitably radical and anti-capitalist directions. So we need to be out there every step of the way saying, you know, we don't we do want to defund the police in the short term and in the long term, we want to abolish them. And I, I promise that's going to uh, only strengthen our project and help get some of the most oppressed people on board. Thanks. Uh, th I mean, thank you both, uh, you know, for coming the second time. Uh, we appreciate it. This is a sort of discussion that was very difficult because we're cramming in so much. I think having a, a starting point like this to, to discuss is, is really important. So thank you both for participating. Um, just as a recap, Eric Blanc is the author of Red State Revolt, The Teacher's Strike Wave and Working Class Politics. He also writes at Jacobin Magazine uh, at jacobinmag.com. Uh, Jimmy Peck is a co-host of the Antifada podcast uh, and a producer and contributor at the Majority Report with Sam Cedar. So thank you both so much for joining. Uh, if people like what they saw here and, and they want to check out more socialism talks, they should they should do that. Um, if you uh, like the politics and you want to know even more, you should uh, you know check out Haymarket Books, uh, Jacobin Magazine, or you should join Democratic Socialists of America and uh, start you know helping contribute to the socialist strategy that we need. Uh, thanks everybody. Uh, hopefully we'll have another one of these and uh, have a good weekend. Bye, everybody.